Hey everybody, this is Andy from the Million Cat Challenge team. I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to join this webinar. We are lucky today to have with us Tim Reeder of Huntsville Animal Services in Alabama. He'll be telling us what return to field looks like from an animal control officer's perspective. Before we begin, we would like to thank Maddie's Fund for hosting this webinar and for making the Million Cat Challenge possible through their generosity. Uh, one other little bit of housekeeping. We are scheduled to go for an hour. We're reserving time for Tim to answer questions at the end of his presentation. But you can submit questions as they arise during the webinar using the Q&A box that's in the left-hand column. Please send us questions as they occur to you, since we don't always have time to answer questions asked at the last minute. Uh, if something comes up that you'd like to ask about, go ahead and type it in right away and we'll queue it up. Now I'd like to introduce Tim Reeder. He's an animal services officer who has worked in the animal services field for 30 years at the city of Huntsville Animal Services in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, in April 2014, Officer Reeder became a crucial participant in Huntsville Animal Services Return to Field Community CAP program. He has continued his training through the Alabama Animal Control Association in the areas of animal cruelty, wildlife, and state and local animal laws throughout the years. Uh, Tim brought a great perspective to our Return to Field Putting Theory into Action panel at this year's Expo. We wanted him to share his wisdom with more people, so take it away, Tim. Well, thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank the Million Cat Challenge and Maddie's Fund for having us here today. I also want to thank all of the participants for being here. I hope everybody's doing well today. Um, I have worked, as I said, with the City of Huntsville for 30 years now, and I've been in the Return to Field program for three years. Um, our first slide, you're going to notice, uh, this is what we do when we try to release a cat out in the field, and the cat decides that the best hiding place it can find is back under your vehicle. Um, now, back in November of, or in December of 2014, I was releasing some cats in an area of uh, Hazel Green, which is a community that's north of Huntsville. I had a, a female uh, cat and two of her kittens that I released. They were about three months old. Uh, that same day, I had several other stops to make. I think I drove around 50 or 60 miles. And um, we got, were also having our holiday dinner that day. so. Um, after I delivered my cats, I came back to the shelter, and we had our dinner. I was there for about two hours, and I was on call that week. So I, I drove my vehicle home, and uh, the next day while I was at work, my wife called me, and she said that there was a cat on our front porch, and she didn't recognize it. So I told her to leave the cat alone, and when I got home, I would look for it. Well, when I got home, I looked around the house, and around our central unit, I found this beautiful little kitten. The closer I looked at the kitten, he had a tipped ear on his, the left side. He was one of the kittens I'd released back in Hazel Green. He had stowed away under my truck for over 60 miles. He'd stayed under there for several hours. He finally decided to come out when he got to our house. Uh, we decided that if he wanted to stay there that bad, that we would go ahead and keep him there. And now, three years later, this is Mario the cat. Um, now, as we said, I've worked for the animal shelter here for 30 years. Um, from 1987 to 2014, uh, we the, our method for um, solving problems that dealt with cats would be to deliver a cat trap to somebody's house. We would catch cats there. We'd bring the cats back to the shelter. And the cats that were not redeemed, which we know very few cats are redeemed, and the cats that were not adopted, which we also know very few cats are adopted, the remainder of the cats were euthanized. Um, that's, that's the method that we used for over years and years and years. And 
Um, in 2014, our director, Dr. Shepard, decided it was time to take a to go in a different direction. Uh, we were not going to be euthanizing healthy cats anymore, and she started our return to field program. She uh, had somebody that um, she had one of our staff members who was a veterinarian technician. Uh, she made her the program coordinator for our uh, return to field program. And between the two of them, they could do some of the neuterings here at the shelter and then the other cats to be operated on. They arranged to have them go to the different vets in the area. Well, they ran into a problem when they were trying to return the cats to the field. Um, they didn't have anybody. They had tried a couple of options and they just didn't work out. Um, here at, at Huntsville Animal Services, we don't just house animals that are from the city of Huntsville. Uh, we also house animals that come from Madison County, the county that we're in. And so whoever is going to be uh, releasing or returning the cats would have to uh, drive all over the county. Uh, it was very time consuming and you would have to really have a good knowledge of the county and the city. Well, like I said, Dr. Shepard had tried a couple of options and they didn't really work. And so she went to our um, field supervisor and she, told, she asked him what he thought about maybe one of our officers delivering the cats. And he said that he thought that it would work out, but he would prefer that we did it on a voluntary basis. So he spoke to the officers individually and asked if we would be willing to return the cats for the, the return to field uh, program. Well, to begin with, the, the idea of the return to field program with our staff was not really popular. Um, a lot of people really didn't understand the program fully, and a lot of people thought we were going to start getting a lot of pushback from the citizens. Um, me personally, I have been um, involved in or in charge of our humane trapping program for over 10 years now. And I knew that all the cats that we were trapping and bringing in, uh, the ones that weren't adopted or weren't, weren't redeemed, they were being euthanized. And so I thought if there's anything that I can do to help to stop euthanizing all these cats, uh, I, I would be willing to do that. So I looked into the program. I saw what it meant. I saw that we would be um, spaying and neutering the cats and releasing them back into their own homes. So I wasn't the only officer who volunteered, but as it turned out, I was probably the best fit. I've lived in the Madison County and in Huntsville all my life. I'm very familiar with all the little small communities in the area. And uh, the, the program, whoever was delivering the cats is going to have to work overtime, a lot of overtime. Um, it's very time consuming um, and and it's not our only function here at Animal Services. I still had to do my job as an animal service officer. So generally, when I delivered the cats, it would be after I've completed all my other assignments, and then I can start on the deliveries. Well, some days it would take, um, I work generally, my hours are from 6 until 2.30. I was working uh, up until 7 or 8 o'clock many nights when we first started the program. But uh, then that's when we start, well, that's when we got our, what I like to call our little TNR team. Um, Dr. Shepard and um, Stephanie would do the surgeries and arrange to send cats to the vets to have their surgeries done. And then I was the one there to release them. And I started uh, releasing them back in 2014. Uh, this is the vehicle I used to release them in. Um, now, after 2014, 
we started broadening our, our program. And we started involving everybody at the animal shelter. So now, in 2017, all of our employees are involved in our, our uh, return to field program. Um, we have our animal care staff. Now, one of their important functions is, of course, taking care of the cats while they're here at the shelter. Another function that they serve is that they take in the animals uh, from the public. So when pu the people bring cats in, they, they take the cats in here at the shelter. Uh, they make sure that they get accurate information about the animals, they get accurate addresses, and they make sure that they get zip codes for, for the cats that come in. Another function that the animal care staff uh, plays in the return to field program is they also transport cats to and from the vet's force to get their surgeries. Now, we have our licensed clerks. And I had several people ask me now, how exactly does a licensed clerk uh, play into your return to field program. Well, the licensed clerks here at the shelter are responsible for entering data. Uh, uh, we still uh, have a lot of handwritten reports in our animal cards that we fill out for each animal that we pick up. Uh, they're all written handwritten. So it's up to our uh, license department, our licensed clerks, to make sure that the addresses are accurate on the cards and when they enter them, and also to make sure that they enter accurate zip codes. Uh, here in Madison County, we have a lot of different communities that have this, that share street names. And so we have to have the zip code to make sure we don't take the cat to the wrong communities. Now, the next people affected is going to be our dispatchers. Dispatchers uh, for the enforcement side of animal services are pretty much our, our life's blood. They're our heartbeat. Um, they're the ones that when citizens call in, they talk to the citizen. <clears throat> if there's a, any particular complaints about cats, they get the information from them. We still have a humane trapping program. If the people are requesting a trap, they get the information so we can deliver the trap to them. And if they have time, they will discuss the return to field program with people on the phone. Now, they're also the first people that receive um, information on problems with cats that we have released. Um, Sometimes they can deal with those problems on the phone, and a lot, the other times they direct them to the program coordinator that's in charge of that. Now, we go to our field officers. This is our first shift. This is our second shift. The field officers, of course, are responsible for uh, delivering traps in the field, they also are, a lot of the times, they're the first ones to discuss the return to field program with people. They, um, whenever we have animal, cats and traps, uh, of course, if the cat has a tipped ear, they go ahead and release it there on site. Now, the gentleman on the far right there in the khaki pants is our field supervisor. Now, anytime um, you're talking about a law enforcement or a group that enforces laws, your supervisors play a very important role, especially when you have major changes, like our return to field program. If the supervisor does not support the program, or if um, they have a, a negative attitude about the program, then it's going to be reflected in all the officers' attitudes. Um, Officer Graham 
Uh, I believe he was a little bit skeptical when we first started uh, talking about our return to field program. Um, and Dr. Shepard uh, allowed Virgie to go to uh, Jacksonville to visit with them and see how their program worked. When he came back, he was completely sold on the program and he was convinced that it would definitely work here in Huntsville. And that's one of the major reasons that the officers are uh, behind the program now. We don't have any of our employees that, that aren't involved in, in the program in some way or another. Um, now, the last group of people I want to show is going to be our program coordinators. The gentleman on the left is Will Robertson. We have Stephanie McBride. We have Karen Buchan and Kristen Anderson. The, um, these are the people that make sure that all of our programs are functioning correctly. Will is our IT guy, and he's also our TI guy. He's the one who is in charge of our turn-in program. Uh, Stephanie and Kristen are the program coordinators in charge of our uh, return to field program. And they also assist Dr. Shepard in some of the surgeries on the animals, and they arrange to make to, to have the animals sent to the vets for their different surgeries. Now, Karen Buchanan is our uh, shelter staff uh, program coordinator. She's over the shelter. So she's the one that coordinates all of our animals, animal care staff uh, and caring for the cats and also making sure that they are able to get to the vets properly. Um, I just want to remind everybody um, to go ahead and send in your questions now. Um, go ahead and send them ahead, please. Now, um, a lot of people have asked why or what purpose or what good does the, the return to field program do for your shelter? How does it really help the shelter? Well, of course, it, our live release rate has increased to 92% for cats as of 2016. Uh, we're no longer euthanizing any healthy cats in the shelter. That reduces the stress on our staff that we're, we're, whose job is to euthanize the animals. We've reduced the number of complaints that we receive on cats. Uh, we've also reduced the number of live intakes, uh, and that reduces the number of animals that you have to house and care for in the shelter. When you reduce the number of animals you have to care for in the shelter, the number of cats, that means the resources that you've used on cats before can now be used redirected into other areas. And another thing that we've seen is a very positive public relations uh, with our return to field program. Um, before the return to field program, when we uh, enforced the stray cat law strictly, uh, we made quite a few enemies among people who were taking care of the caretakers of the cats. Um, if there were any problems that they had, they would never call us um, because they didn't trust anything we did. Now, the same people that didn't trust us uh, because we were enforcing the laws at the time, uh, they're calling us now all the time. They want to work with us on the return to field program. Um, they, they want to have the animals uh, altered and brought back to the properties. So that's one thing that has really surprised me is the number of people that at one time would have never even talked to us. Um, they're actually now calling us and asking for assistance with the cats. Um, now, I want to look at the, the last thing I want to look at, and I'm, I'm probably coming up a little bit short on our time, but we'll have more time for questions this way, is our graph. Now, this graph, uh, it reflects that from 2000, we started 
uh, in 2009 having our reduced rate, our spay and neuter programs. Um, and you can see that after the, pro the reduced rate spay or neutering, neuter program started, um, all of our intakes started reducing quite a bit. But if you'll notice the um, number of animals that we were still euthanizing, and we had very few animals that were, on a, that were live release. In 2000, April of 2014, uh, when Dr. Shepard went with the return to field program, you can see the large increase in the number of animals that we really, the live release animals. And then the following two years, of course, it got higher and higher. Now, in those three years, 2014, 2015, and 2016, there were over 5,300 animals that we, uh, that were released live from the city of Huntsville. Previously, before 2014, those animals would have been euthanized. So uh, you can see the great difference uh, and the number of animals that were live released and the number of animals that were euthanized. Um, I just want to close with one final statement. Um, and, and let me just say that for years and years, we've been trapping cats and euthanizing cats. We have not done anything to curb the overpopulation problem with cats. Uh, we now have the return to field program. The return to field program not only saves the lives of the cats, but it also reduces the overpopulation problem that we have with cats. And I really believe as animal services personnel, it's our responsibility to use the best solution that solves the problem, and that is the return to field program. All right, well, thank you, Tim. Uh, we've got a few questions lined up here now. Um, the first one is, how many cats pass through your RTF program annually? Well, Hang on just a second, okay? Oh, I have. I'm, I'm, now I'm not 100% sure. I'm, uh, like I said, I'm on the end that releases the cats, but I would estimate around 1,000 to 1,500 cats uh, go through our program annually. Okay, and, and here's a question that is always popular. How is your spay and neuter TNR program funded? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm having to consult one of our uh, program coordinators on this. Hang on just a second. It is budgeted um, through the through our annual budget, um, and that is something that we um, had to fight for um, to finally make this work through our city administration. Um, we had a new city administration our administrator start. Um, he's like the voice to the mayor. Um, he started, I guess, the, about two years ago or right around this time. And he's really been a big support um, in doing what it takes to get us um, the, the funds for, you know, spay and neuter programs. Okay, thanks. Um, the next question uh, is, what's the population of your county? And maybe you can also tell us uh, what's the square miles you mentioned driving yeah. 60 miles. 
Yeah, I know the county is about 860 square miles, um, and that's not counting the uh, land that Huntsville is annexed into other counties. So we're, we're, we're looking at above 860 square miles. Um, Huntsville's population, I believe, is around 200,000, and the county, I believe, is around 400,000. Okay, um, how did you get the communities to support this and how do you deal with the CAT complaints? Well, uh, the way, basically we haven't uh, put out any advertisements. Uh, most everything we do is word of mouth right now. Um, when people call in with uh, concerns about CATs, um, we still have a humane trapping program. I'm the one in charge of that. And so the the advantage to that is uh, when I deliver the cat to the people that are, or deliver the trap to people that are having problems, I can just discuss our return to field program with them. Um, most of the time I tell them this is our policy and that the cat will be coming back. Um, we still deal with our cat complaints the same, basically the same way uh, as we did in the past. We still have laws on the books about cats. Um, and, and we do, if, if a person uh, owns cats as opposed to somebody who is feeding community cats, we still hold them responsible for the cats that they own, uh, uh, as you know, cats being the ones that they keep in the house or the ones that are their true pets. Okay, um, did you, have you encountered much pushback when you explain what the policy is um, when you're delivering a trap or, or when you're uh, delivering a cat back to the field? Um, it's, it's really been surprising. Um, we don't, we've had very limited pushback. Um, and, and that's the reason um, when we ask for volunteers from the officers, that, ever, that a lot of the officers were leery about um, volunteering is because they perceived that there would be pushback when we out, were out in the field. Well, I'll, I've worked here long enough. I can take it. If they're going to push back, I'll, I'll, I'll handle it. But the number, I mean, I could count on one hand the number of people in the field that have given us problems. Uh, the most problems we have are uh, the phone calls, and our dispatchers uh, handle quite a few of those problems themselves. And then if they can't handle the problem, uh, they direct it to one of our program coordinators and let them take care of it. Okay, and, and when they get calls, do your dispatchers have a script prepared for this kind of complaint, or do they just pass it along? No, um, they don't have a script for it. Um, and a lot of times they, they um, I guess they kind of play it by ear, I guess you would say, depending on... Um, how emphatic the person is that's complaining. Um, if if they, uh, what they will do is they will try to explain it to them once. Our dispatchers don't have a whole lot of time to spend discussing it. So if that doesn't work, then they will uh, pass it on to somebody else uh, that has more time to explain it. Okay. Um can you describe the logistics of how the cats are handled uh, from trapping to surgery to being released? What is the role of each partner and the public organizations in the process? Yeah, um, when, we, when we catch a cat, generally, um, um, like I said, I'm the one that, that sets the traps. I'm the one that will be bringing them in. Our other officers also bring them in when I'm not available. Uh, we, we leave the cats in the same trap. Um, they, if, we, if it's a, a neutering, we can do those in-house. So we can, we can do, have those turned around in one day 
uh, have the surgery done and then uh, have their uh, time for them to heal and then release them uh, within two days. The, the females, we have to send them out to uh, different ve uh, veterinarians in the area. So um, they, they take just a, a day or two longer for us to turn them around. But um, the cats are, are kept in the same cages uh, that they're trapped in. Um, we, we try to get as accurate an address as we can uh, to release them back into and then take them back out in the same trap and release them uh, as soon as we can. Um, okay, let's, uh, I'm going to push this next question. It's from our own Dr. Karsten here at the Correct Shelter Medicine Program. Um, it says, would you be willing to talk with other shelters and community leaders about how you implemented your program and the feedback received from the community? Yes, we. we I, I would. I believe uh, the, any of the program coordinators would. Um, yes, we would, we would be willing to speak to people about it. Great. Uh, we have a question from Edmonton. Uh, we have minimum hold periods here in Alberta, Canada. Ferals fall under them, unfortunately. How do you ensure the cat isn't owned or stressed during hold periods? Well, now, um, we, we, we have, I guess you would say, two different classes of cats um, when they are brought into the shelter. The, the um, cats that we pick up in traps, we consider them to be feral. And those we, we don't, um, since those are not coming into our system, um, they aren't entering, uh, we, we don't keep them at the shelter. They are turned around and released back to the same place. So they aren't really considered to be kept at the shelter. Um, we don't use the hold period on those cats. Now, if it were to be a stray cat that we thought was owned by somebody, then we have uh, laws that dictate how long we have to keep those cats. I, ho okay, I hope that answers. Related, here's a related question. We have residents drop stray cats, in quotes, at our shelter and don't necessarily give the correct location. Many turn in neighbor's cats. How would you recommend overcoming this issue? And thanks for doing RTF. Yeah. Um, well, now, here at, at Huntsville Animal Services, um, anybody, uh, whether it's a stray or an owner turn-in uh, animal, we require that they show us a photo ID. Um, that has eliminated a lot of the problems we have with people trying to turn in their neighbor's cats because we have it on record where the cat came from, and if the neighbor finds out that they turned in their cat, then there can be re repercussions. Um, so that's, that's basically how we have overcome that problem is, is making sure that we get a photo ID from the, the uh, person turning in the animal. Okay, thanks for that. Um, looking through the questions here. Um, I think you actually answered a couple of them in the process of answering others. Um, let's see, so here's an interesting one. Uh, I'm most interested in the dialogue that goes along with the public bringing in stray cats who say they don't want the cats back. I have heard from some other shelters who use RTF that they simply don't tell the public. It's written in a stray cat intake form that they sign, but we all know people don't read those. So how do you avoid conflict with the public specifically at intake? Well, right now we don't have a, um, a set policy that we use for, and for bringing or for people turning in the cats. We, have, we were discussing this a little bit earlier today um the it it's really uh it de it's circumstantial it depends on each different situation as to how we handle that 
Um, most of the time, if they're adamant about the cat not coming back, um, we will have them talk to one of the program coordinators. And if they can't convince them um, that the cat can come, or if they aren't convinced that the cat needs to come back, we do have what we call our barn cat program. Um, and that's for the cats that just absolutely cannot be returned um, to wherever they came from. And um, us being a, a publicly run facility, sometimes when those people are extremely adamant about this, we really don't have much option but to go ahead and put them in our barn cat program. But what we try to do, everything we can to uh, convince these people that the cat needs to come back. Uh, we emphasize, of course, that the males aren't going to exhibit the same problems that they did before. Um, there won't be the howling and the, the urinating on, on things and the fighting amongst themselves. Um, sometimes, you know, you can actually convince people um, to go ahead and let us turn them back. One, one thing that I do um, when I'm talking to people that are really adamant about not having the cat come back um, is I start to kind of um, uh, talk about, do you, do you have rats in the area? Do you have snakes in the area that are a problem? Uh, especially in Huntsville, we have a lot of problems with chipmunks. And when you let people know that these feral cats um, are not going to reproduce, they're not going to show the same uh, problems that they did before for the, um, you know, the howling and the urinating and all the stuff the males do. Um, a lot of times people are convinced to go ahead and let them come back. I've even had ask, have people ask me to bring more cats into their area um, after I've told them that. Yeah, I can imagine that'd be the case. Uh, here's yeah. an interesting question from Maui. Uh, do you have areas that cats are not allowed to be released back to, like wildlife areas, state parks, et cetera? What do you do with those cats? Now, um, here in Huntsville, we do not have that problem. Um, when when uh, we were in Fort Lauderdale, I heard some uh, discussion uh, about that. And if there are areas that the uh, uh, that especially like with um, migrate, migratory bird problems and, and things like that. Um, I, I heard somebody use a, as a very common sense uh, uh, thing that they said, don't, don't release them there, find an alternative place to release them. You don't have to release them in that same area, but somewhere close. But um, uh, here in Huntsville, that, that is not a problem for us. We don't have really any areas that we're not allowed to release the cats back into. Okay, I'd like to give people one last chance to enter questions. If you have a question, um, please go ahead and enter it now, or we may be able to uh, leave a little early. I know Tim's in the middle of kitten season. I imagine a lot of you are. Um, and if you missed any part of the presentation, it will be available online later and you can uh, watch it from the beginning at your leisure. Okay, we've got a new question here. Um, so let's push that to Tim. And that says, is anybody responsible for feeding them or taking care of them during illness or injury? Well, we prefer to have caretakers uh, that are responsible for that. Um, but we, uh, as far as us holding anybody uh, particularly responsible for the cats once we release them, um, no, no, we don't. Um, the, the, our, our, the way we look at it is um, if the cat was healthy um, when we trapped it or when we got it, um, it, it should, there's no reason it shouldn't be healthy when we release it back to where it came from. Right, and so I, not, I assume then you wouldn't release a cat that is not healthy. No, we do a health check on all the cats before we release them. So if there are any health problems with the cat at all, they're not released. Um, 
As a matter of fact, we have uh, several little uh, uh, shelter cats in the back that have different problems that we're waiting on them to heal up so that they can be released again. Okay, and what about kittens? Do you return kittens to field, and if so, at what age? Uh, we prefer that we want the cats to be at least two pounds or two months of age. Uh, anything under that, we, we don't want them to come into the shelter, and we encourage people to, uh, to wait until they're at least two pounds or two months old. Um, and that's, that's why um, right now we're really um, uh, being deluged with a lot of cats because uh, the people that we told in June in July to wait for two months. Well, two months is up now, and those kittens are of age, and they they can be uh, have their surgery and be released now. Okay. Um, here's uh, an interesting question. I think there was a great video a while ago promoting your team and their efforts. Can you share the link again? We can find it. Um, we don't have it at this time. I don't. We don't have it right now. If um, if we can get their information, we can send it to them. Okay, and and we and if you send us the link, then of course we'll post it on the Million Cat Challenge website as well. Okay. Ah, I think uh, maybe Target Zero has it. Um, okay, somebody's asking for a little clarification. Kittens, so you do RTF kittens instead of adoption? We do both. Um, if the kittens are feral, um, we, we go ahead and, and put them in the RTF program. Um, generally, um, what Dr. Shepard uh, prefers to do is if the cats come in in a trap, uh, they enter into our RTF program. Um, you know, we get, we get so many other cats that come in through the doors um, and also cats that, um, uh, um, that we have people that are um, fostering for us that, that come back in. So we have plenty of kittens to adopt uh, that so that we can we can uh, also do the RTF on the ones in the traps. Okay, um, we'll make one last call for questions, and uh, if there are none, then we can end a little early. All right, well, I think we're good. Um, thank you, Tim, for joining us in the middle of kitten season, uh, and also for sharing your story about Mario. I've heard of foster fails before, but this is the first RTF fail I've ever heard of. Um, yeah, he thank was... you to all our, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, Mario's a very determined little fella. <laughs> Sounds like he would be, yeah. Um, and we want to say thank you to all our participating shelters. Uh, if your shelter isn't already in the challenge and has the desire to save even just one more feline life, we welcome you to join us. To register, visit www.millioncatschallenge.org. If you have any questions, we're always here to help. You can reach us at info at milliongatchallenge.org. And if you missed any part of today's presentation or you want to share it with someone else, we've got you covered. We'll be posting an archived version of this webinar to our website, where you can also find archives of all our previous webcasts. Thanks again for taking time out of your busy day to be here, and have a great day.